all part of the same family, which is different sizes and colors and uh, you know, so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, all humans are valued the same. So if that's the case, then our schools should value uh, 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 children the same. In housing, we should value people the same. In access to capital and banking and financing, uh, the systems we have should value people the same. And the reality is they, they don't today and they never have. Welcome back to Happiness in Progress. I'm your host, Danielle Craig. I'm an Emmy Award winner, former journalist, mom, wife, and just a person looking for more joy in the everyday. This podcast is brought to you by the Mail Tribune. You can find more podcasts at mailtribune.com. Today on this episode, we are talking about race. I know this last week has been a sobering one for a lot of people. It has been sorrowful, hate-filled, anger-filled, fear-filled. And I really wanted to add something to the conversation that could help us move forward, help us move forward and take the next positive step. That's why I turned to Mike and Emily Green and asked them to be on the podcast. Mike and Emily are a biracial couple who have created a workshop called How to Talk to Kids About Race in America. With riots happening across the country, they have also put together an incredible resource called How to Talk to Kids About Riots in America. Mike is the co-founder of Scale Up Partners, LLC. It's a national consultancy specializing in inclusive economic competitiveness strategies. In this episode, we talked about a lot. We talked about how to talk to kids about race in America, of course. But to be able to do that, we need to have some context. We have, need to have some learning of our own. We really can't address issues like race with our kids unless we know the history of what's happened in this country. So we also talk about that. I just want to start by thanking, thanking you guys for being here with me today. I really appreciate it. We're excited to be here. <laughs> The first thing I wanted to ask is, I know that, you know, this has really been a heavy week, I think for everyone, as we've been, a lot of white people are learning new things. A lot of, of black people are feeling a lot of pain and anger and fear. And um, now a lot of white people for the first time are saying, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that was happening. I know this is something you guys live on a daily basis. I know you teach this, you, you see this a lot, but I'm wondering, is there anything that has happened within the last week or two? that has been an aha moment for you guys? Have you said, oh, this is where we are as a collective? I would love to offer that I feel like we are seeing, Danielle, this incredible shift in people's desire to listen and to learn. I actually had a girlfriend stop by 20 minutes ago and drop off a book of mine that she borrowed. And she said she's just been kind of broken, but also hopeful this week because her paradigm is kind of shifting. And so I know that I keep hearing that that message, which is we finally are seeing that there's something that we need to listen to. And mm-hmm. that feels really hopeful. <laughs> what about for you, Mike? Well, uh, what's happening is reminiscent of many times before in our history. Uh, even in 1963, when um, demonstrations occurred in a thousand cities that no one talks about to this day. Uh, so, on this side of the perspective, I'm seeing hope because we're starting to see what we saw in 1963 with the rise of the Negro American Revolution, which no one te- talks about in their homes or in schools, but it was led by Dr. King. He wrote about it extensively, as did the government, and called it the most important event in the post war period of the United States. And so, that event which had very specific triggers, is now I'm seeing uh, action in the streets that is reminiscent of the Negro American Revolution. And so that gives me great hope. Mm -hmm. So do you think we are at a tipping point where we're going to see some real change occur? I absolutely do, because I see that we are listening not only to individual stories more, Danielle, but I think there's a, there's a, a desire to listen to the narrative of our nation and our nation's history. So as we are learning that history, becoming really curious about it, beginning to understand some of the systems, I think there are insertion places within systems. Hmm. And I see some of that. I see that happening in Mike's work professionally, sort of helping to create um, 
insertion places within education and within systemic structures um, to, to, to sort of move that change forward. And I feel like there's a, a really a stronger sense of curiosity about it and the desire to step into it, which feels really, really good. Mm-hmm. Isn't, ama- isn't it amazing what curiosity can do? It is the essential first step, isn't it? It really mm-hmm. feels like the starting place. Mm-hmm. And that leads me to the next question, because my next question is, you guys talk about um, how to talk about race in America. For people listening, what is the starting point? The starting place is to have the conversations. But what we find is that we often feel super uncomfortable having conversations about things with which we don't have a lot of understanding. So I think as parents, we feel unsure about how to navigate the conversation. And so as we as parents and adults and educators begin to get a foundation of understanding, then we begin to in, in, engage in conversations and do it comfortably. And in our home, it's just routine. It's a part of the daily culture of our home, which mm-hmm. is to be really um, open and intentional about discussing and sharing and informing. But that really starts for us as parents having a, a foundational sense of understanding so that we feel comfortable with the conversation. Mm-hmm. What do you think, Mike? You look like you were about to say something <laughs> as well. <laughs> I think it starts with having a common frame of reference mm-hmm. and common knowledge. Mm-hmm. And when we start talking to people about race and asking them, well, what is your definition of race? What do you think it is? And people are all over the map with what race is. And, and most people related to individual relationships versus uh, systemic institutionalized biases. What we do is we give people a common frame of reference that race is really a, an abbreviated form of racial hierarchy, which mm-hmm. is a value system. So the question is, it, whether, whether I'm talking to someone of my own race or someone of different races, and these are all societal constructs, do you value me in the same way you value yourself? Are, are the lives of children who do not look like you equal to the lives of children who look like you? And if we all are saying yes, then guess what? We have a common frame of reference. We have a common value system that we're all human beings. We're all part of God's family. We're all part of the same family. We're just different sizes and colors and, uh, you know, so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, all humans are valued the same. So if that's the case, then our schools should value uh, 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 children the same. In housing, we should value people the same. In access to capital and banking and financing, uh, the systems we have should value people the same. And the reality is they, they don't today and they never have. So the question becomes, are we going to pass down these disparate systems to the next generation and sustain the status quo of segregationist policies and practices we inherited from the 20th century? Or are we, through this momentous occasion with people rioting, Mm -hmm. protesting in the streets, are we going to change these systems and say, we do value people, we value one another equally? And that's what people are trying to say. We're humans too. Our lives matter. I want to talk through some of those systems because I think a big part of this is having the knowledge to understand this is still happening. Um, Even just this week, I read about redlining and my mind just exploded. And I thought, I cannot believe this is happening. And every person who I've talked to since about it has been like, what? What is happening? Like, how is this acceptable? So we're going to come back to that. But first I want to uh, talk about talking about what is race to our children. Um, I, you know, I have two little kids and they have um, asked me about the different colors of our skin. And I, I looked through your presentation and I worry that I'm giving them a watered down version, which is why I want to come to this. I go back to, you know, we're all different. You have blue eyes. I have brown eyes. You have food allergies. I don't. Our friend over there uh, is in a wheelchair. We are all different and we're all valued the same. Is that a watered down version or is there something else I can talk about uh, with him? I think it's a both and. I think that we, in many ways, really do offer simple clarity to our kids. And what you're doing is that simple clarity. There isn't a watered downness about, about noting that difference and then saying, 
really quite clearly, we are a part of the human race. Here we all are, right? And our kids have this really instinctive sense of like, well, yes, this is a boy. I'm a boy. She's, you know, and, and here we are all on the same place as children. Um, but I do think that, that we also can infuse the age appropriate information as the time opens up. And so mm-hmm. that, that our, our children do have a, a more clear sense about the sort of sense of racial hierarchy in our culture. And we don't, I would say we neither water that down, nor do we um, overwhelm them with mm-hmm. too much information. But as the moment presents itself, they do have a sense that our country historically has placed a higher value based on skin color and that systems were built in that way. So I'll tell you this. Um, my youngest son, age seven, he said, Daddy, I wish I was white. Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> and I said, okay. That's what so I did, he, he, here's, here's the thing, son. Now, they have friends of all our colors. Most of them, we live in Southern Oregon, most of their friends are white. And they know that, but it doesn't matter. And their friends see them, and it doesn't matter that whatever color they are, they value each other the same. We love each other as friends. And, and so the, the through line for our children is consideration. We, we use the word considerate as kind, generous, and sharing. And if you ask my boys, ages seven and nine, what is considerate, they will say in unison, kind, generous, and sharing. <laughs> that is how not only we treat our family, but we treat our friends, we treat everybody in society because what, we're all one human family. So we treat everyone with consideration. That being said, we ask them, whose lives are valued more? Your life, the lives of your friends, the lives of people you don't even know around the world, whose lives are valued more? And they say, no one, everyone's equal. That's children saying that now. If children can understand that all lives are equal, that all humans have the same value system, if children can understand that, why can't adults? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I don't yeah, see where children. we're watering down anything. We're actually trying to get adults to understand what children already know. Okay. I wanted to make sure that I was at least on the right pathway in talking about my kids about race. Um, we could probably do a full episode, maybe like a two-parter episode on history in America and how it's being taught in schools. I I just want to briefly touch on it because again, the education, it's power for the people who are listening. What is something, what is an, a, real, a realization you would want listeners to take away about our American history and how we've been taught it in schools? Wow. How are you going to summarize this one? <laughs> <laughs> this is about a hundred <laughs> slides in the presentation. That's exactly right. <laughs> right. But there, there are three significant eras in, in American history, three. Mm-hmm. The first one was when white men first arrived on this continent. So no white men had been on this continent for millennia. Generations and generations of people lived here without ever seeing a white man. And when they first arrived, what did, how did they treat the white man that first arrived? With consideration. They welcomed them. They helped them. The white man who came here, the white men who came here were trying to escape terrible conditions and start their lives anew, and they were welcome. So that's that's a good start. The challenge became when they continued to come and they were told, you can't take up so much of the land, and they asked, who owns the land? And they said, no one owns the land. It's like owning air. You can't own the air. You can't own the land. You can't own the water. And they were... The response was, wait a minute, no one owns this? <laughs> well, that's when you have a conflict. When someone says, I'm going to own something that doesn't belong to me. Children understand instinctively. If someone comes to our home and says, you guys have to leave, we're going to take it up. That's not, that's not considering. Mm-hmm. So in that first era, in the formation of this nation, you had a conflict of people not being considerate and doing uh, uh, something that's terrible. They're taking land, stealing land, and, and, and hurting the people that live here. Now, that being said, when they finally formed this nation, the very first thing they had to do is to ask themselves one question, and that is, what are you going to do with black people? And they asked every state in the formation of each state, are you going to be slave or slave-free? That was the quintessential definition of how you were coming into this country. 
as wow. a slave so they, state or slave free. They were literally asking that question. That is the question. You were either going to be a slave state or a slave free state. Wow. So the only question, the quintessential question of when we formed this country, what, you, what defined your state is whether or not you were slave or slave free. And that happened all the way up to the Civil War. Wow. So that's the question. What are we going to do with black people? Now, we, we certainly couldn't do with uh, uh, white people did not agree on what they were going to do with black people. But they did agree on what they were going to do with the natives. They were going to put them out of sight, out of mind. And they could not do that with black people because black people were property. And when they were in the states where they weren't property, they weren't actual citizens of the entire United States. They were only citizens of small of, of certain states. I want to interrupt really quickly to say that, Daniel, for me, it was powerful to realize that our nation was formed as a whites only citizen. Wow. And I think that that, that that simple, cohesive picture is missing from all of our history knowledge, right? Which is this was formed as a whites only nation, period. Right. And that didn't change for how many years? It did not change even after the Civil War. Right. What they were fighting over for the, in the Civil War is over whether or not we're going to continue to be a, uh, a slave or enslaved free uh, nation. Abraham Not Lincoln wanted to unify the nation, mm. and that meant freeing the slaves. But the question became, after the Civil War, what are we going to do with these black people? Because now you have four million refugees. And uh, white people did not want them living next door. They did not want them uh, uh, patronizing their businesses. They did not want them to, all the various different, did not want, the NIMBYs, not in my backyard. So they formed a Freedmen's Bureau. When I say they, I'm talking about the white radicals who were very adamant that black people not only were equal to us, equal to white people, but they were, we we're going to give them the same economic underpinning that we, uh, we were giving uh, uh, European settlers who came here. And so the Freedmen's Bureau was, was erected and the 13th Amendment was done. Uh, to uh, prohibit slavery. And then the 14th Amendment in 1868 actually extended uh, citizenship, the whites only citizenship, to incorporate black people and give them standing as citizens of the entire United States. And then the 15th Amendment gave them the right to vote. And they had to impeach a white supremacist president to get that done. So that was a big fight. When people say, what's the greatest era in, in U.S. history? I say it's 1865 to 1872, because that was the biggest fight that white people had between themselves over the fate of black people. And after wow. 1872, all of it was undone. And for 100 years, there was terrorism targeting black people. And everything we built was torn apart. And, it, and Dr. King talked about it extensively. It's even in his iconic speech where he says, I have a dream. That's at the end of his speech. That's the crescendo. At the beginning, he talks about the reality. He says, 100 years later, the Negro is still not free. 100 years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. And he goes on with that 100 years later refrain. That's the very first part of the speech. And then he says, and so today we've come to dramatize a shameful condition. Now, the question becomes, after Dr. King died in 1868, 1968, that was a, what have we done to rectify that shameful condition? And the reality is that it has, de, it has devolved. It has gone exponentially worse. And the three things that Dr. King was fighting over, is segre, ending segregation in schools, ending discrimination in housing, and ending discrimination in banking, those three things we don't even talk about today. Wow. But I think that the data is extremely important in that when you say the shameful conditions have gotten worse, it's really hard for us to understand what that means unless we see data which says, what is the black home ownership rate today? It is worse today than it was when Dr. King said that. Another point of fact, uh, discrimination in banking, well, we would go like discrimination in banking. That seems like such a, I don't think that that's actually real. Well, we know that in the last decade, Banks were fined $243 billion for discriminatory practices. Wow. So we know. That in the last decade. In the last Just in the last decade. decade. Nothing, <laughs> nothing's changed. And of course, segregation in schools is, is worse today than it was on the day that Dr. King died. Okay, so let's go through these, let's go through these policies. Um, let's start with um, the segregation in schools. Because I think most people are going to say, well, we don't segregate schools. 
but I think people can also realize that typically there are schools where mostly people of color are attending and mostly people of white people who are white that's, are attending. Right. Talk, talk by, me through this. That is by design. Well, that's how we started. That is how we started. Keep, keep in mind that uh, black kids were not allowed to go to white schools. Mm -hmm. So when they came off the plantations and the Freedmen's Bureau was to start building schools for black kids and we built higher education institutions. They're called historically black colleges and institutions, HBCUs. And after the Civil War, all the way up until Dr. King gave his iconic speech on the mall in 1963, we were still building HBCUs because we could not, uh, our children were not allowed to go to the um, uh, uh, white schools. In fact, when I was born in 1962, James Meredith sued to get into the University of Mississippi and successfully, he was the very first black man in 1962 to get into the University of Mississippi and a riot started out, 30,000 mm. people. So wow. we have this problem of valuing black children and their education and their uh, um, uh, uh, capabilities mm. in this society. So we're not cultivating that talent in the way we should. We're not valuing that talent in the way we should. And that's how they start their lives. Mm -hmm. So then we, when you get into the housing and, uh, and discrimination, and you talk about redlining, uh, and you, uh, the great migration where we were fleeing the South and going to North and, and West and finding that the same kind of discriminatory practices were in those places. So ultimately, by the time you get to 1967 and the long, hot summer, where riots broke out in 164 cities in one year, most people today are not even aware of that. Mm -hmm. And yet, it changed the city of Detroit forever. Mm -hmm. In fact, the city of Detroit, which is 90% minority today, used to be 90% white. Wow. You know, I think um, you said we're not even aware of that. I think there's a lot that we're not aware of. I mean, even Martin Luther King Jr.'s full speech. I don't right. think most of us know the full speech. I think we know I have a dream. Uh, so let's, um, let's talk through some actionable steps and um, kind of try to educate the people listening, myself included, um, on what is happening and what can happen to make things better. So let's talk about schools first. Tell me about what is happening in schools. How is segregation still existing and what can happen um, to fix this? Okay. So the vast majority of black and brown uh, children are stuck in the lowest quality schools, the, uh, the most underfunded schools in our country. So uh, right now, ubiquitously across the country, if you go to any city and you ask them where are your poorest schools, your lowest quality schools, they're going to point you to the lowest income, the most vulnerable populations, the most needy children. That's where we put our worst schools. That should be flipped. So we should not be talking about inclusion. We should be talking about prioritizing because we have, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, decimated these families and these children for generations. We have devalued them. We have underfunded them. We have deliberately kept them and denied them the kind of opportunity to, uh, uh, to share in the American dream that we provide uh, white children. And so if we're, going to, uh, if we're going to change this, then we have to change the funding system. Mm -hmm. So right now, we fund, we fund schools according to tax, uh, um, uh, real estate tax. Property values, yeah. Property values. And um, most of the funding for all of education comes from state and local taxes. The federal government, out of $694 billion that goes into funding schools uh, nationwide, the federal government only puts in $55 billion. So states and local governments are running the show. And that's the way they want it. Because when you set that up initially, the states were able to control what the children were taught. And so if the federal government, which every time there's been an intervention, it's been the federal government. The federal government is going to have a louder voice in this and compel the states to provide better quality schools to the most vulnerable population. It's going to have to drastically and exponentially increase the funding that goes into it. Mm -hmm. What about um, changing the way that we're funding in terms of 
it blows my mind that our schools are funded by the property taxes that are within that school zone. And so if you are in a, a wealthy neighborhood, more funding is going to go to the school instead of if you're in a, a neighborhood that doesn't have a lot of money, that's less funding. Is there a way, should it make sense to me that we should just get rid of that and use all of the property taxes and like give schools the same amount, right? Is that what we should be doing? Am I on the right I, track? I, that's a beautiful model. I think that the city of Seattle actually had a, a Supreme Court lawsuit because residents in the wealthier sections were adamantly opposed. So as of like in 2007, 2007 right now, that's sort of unfolding where residents are saying, oh, I don't think so. And mm -hmm. I don't think so at all. And I think we come back to um, an, wow. a, 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 not only valuing, but I think, Danielle, that we... Um, as a culture, will pour resources into schools to cultivate talent, maybe in a sports pipeline. But do we recognize talent and capacity that can be cultivated in what's going to be a minority majority population in, in STEAM subjects and in other areas? And so I think there's this incredible shift, whereas a nation, if we begin to see the value in all humans and in our most vulnerable communities, not just because of the vulnerability, but because of the incredible capacity to, to contribute and the potential for genius and for brilliance and for like offering to our culture all this that God's created within every child, right? I have goosebumps, Emily. I think absolutely, absolutely. Um, what does it look like? What is a school that is funded well? versus a school that is not funded well. What is the disparity between the two? Well, I'll tell you right now that uh, across the country, you can find schools that are serving the most vulnerable populations, and you're seeing 100% graduation rate. You're seeing 100% of those kids go to college. You're seeing a lot of the kind of outcomes that you want to see. Now, these happen to be in small pockets, and they're well-funded, and, and they hire the best teachers and they get the best outcomes. But that's because they're very intentional about it. And they also know that many of these kids are coming from generational poverty. Many of these kids are coming from dysfunctional homes or broken homes or coming from communities that have been economically starved deliberately. And that means there's lots of battles over scarcity. There's lots of violence. There's lots. Imagine being a seven or eight year old kid and having to navigate all that. Your respite, your only opp opportunity to escape that is in the school. And so if the school understands that, that it cannot operate in the same way a school operates in a wealthy community with all the assets and all the support system, that this school knows that it is the only opportunity for this child. And this child is not just a child, but this child is the next doctor. This child's the next CEO. This child's the next astronaut. And we are responsible for cultivating that. When you see that happening in pockets, then the question is, if it can happen in pockets and they're demonstrating proof of concept that yes, that talent can be cultivated, why can't we do this everywhere around the country? Why can't we expand this? And the reason is, is because we simply do not have the same value system across the country for these children. And so that's the, that's the quintessential question that we're asking ourselves. When you see the police brutalize people, and this is not new, this has been going on since there have been police. <laughs> So uh, I, I like to read uh, uh, people when I'm on uh, other interviews. I like to read them a quote that is, is I, I don't have it in front of me, but it's a, it says, uh, our lives and our homes and our families are constantly under di uh, um, distress because of unrestrained police brutality. Now that quote comes from 1938. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it comes from a, a, an organization that's talking about police brutality back in 1938. The bottom line is, if we don't value people, then we don't invest in them the same way. And I think that we can change that, but we have to start talking about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I worked in Las Vegas as a news producer for a long time ago, more than a decade ago at this point. And it was have these, the police brutality specifically against people of color, black people was happening and it was not getting national attention. And I don't think a lot of people realize that we, we covered it. We covered rallies that were happening in the city of Las Vegas. We, we talked to an expectant mother who just 
lost her, her, I, I think significant other, her partner, um, because of police brutality. And that never made national news, although we covered it, it never made national news. So this is, I think a shift within the last, I don't yes. know, five, 10 years that we have been seeing this, but it's been going on long before. I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, let's go to housing. What is happening in housing and how can we fix it? We're, now you're going back to the great migration. And because we don't teach history, we don't teach social studies, we don't teach economics, we don't teach the, uh, the, the government, we don't teach the history of this country. Fully the, and truthfully. Fully and truthfully. And truthfully. Mm -hmm. then, and what we have is that we have generations of people who grow up never knowing these things took place. Well, the right. great migration was when uh, uh, millions of black people were fleeing the South where they were being killed indiscriminately. In fact, the, uh, right after um, uh, the Great Compromise, when I told you the greatest era is 1865 to 1872. Well, after 1872, uh, when you had uh, many of the white radicals, by, by the way, I always look for white radicals because those are the ones that are fighting for our on our behalf. And I want to, you know, those are greatest allies. Um, when, when they were overthrown, uh, I, uh, I, you know, they, they left Congress, uh, some of them died, but there was a great compromise between the, the North and the South to remove the troops, to put uh, the congressional leaders, uh, the, uh, the Southern leaders back in the Congress. What ended up happening is you had all these black codes. Most people are not familiar with what black codes are, pig laws and vagrancy laws, convict leasing. In fact, Alabama had three quarters of its state revenue from convict leasing, which is basically you find a black person on the street, the police would pick them up. They would be put in jail for vagrancy, not having a job. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then they would be sent, given long sentences, uh, prison sentences, and then they would be leased out to the very same plantation owners where they used to be slaves. There, there was the economy uh, for, for a number of states. And Alabama was one of the uh, biggest offenders. Now, that being said, we had to build our own communities because we could not live in white communities. And so we did, we built our own communities, we built our own schools. In fact, some of them were so prosperous, they became known as Black Wall Streets. So you had Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma, 1921. It was burned to the ground, 35 blocks. Hospitals, businesses, libraries, uh, thousands of families displaced all in, in, a, in a, uh, uh, a day. And uh, you know they flew airplanes over and bombed the, the community completely destroyed. Yet you, you have Wall Street in Durham, North Carolina. You have Wall Street in Harlem. You have multiple Wall Street, Black Wall Streets. These were segregated communities where black people thrived. And so what ended up happening is that all of these were destroyed. And by the time they were rebuilt in the 1950s, they were destroyed again because of urban planning. So when you say, when people say we're going to, you know, we have urban planning uh, um, uh, strategies and this, that, and the other, urban planning to white people means you are making something better, where urban planning for black people means you're about, to, <laughs> you're about to tear down our communities again, because ubiquitously all of our communities were uh, uh, torn down and freeways were built through them. So now we're looking for other places to live and we're told you can only live in these certain places. And so we were corralled, no matter what your income was, we were corralled into certain places and they called it redlining. And the banks would not loan to you, so you couldn't fix your house up. You couldn't buy another house. If you had a house in a red line community and you wanted to sell it, it was worth less. And so today, home ownership among black people today is at the same rate or lower than the rate it was in, in the 1950s during urban planning. Now, that being said, the wealth that we were uh, uh, attempting to accumulate today is so, is so poor that it would take 228 years for the average black family to make the same amount of wealth as the average white family if the white family didn't make another nickel. Now, if you, if you take that down to just Boston, where you have Harvard University, MIT, Cambridge, uh, uh, Boston College, you have a wealth of intellectual knowledge, and uh, it's, it's the second a most prosperous uh, a city in the country. Well, the average white family has uh, a net worth of about $250,000 and the average black family in Boston today
has an average net worth of eight dollars, not eighty, not eight hundred, eight. That's where we are today. <laughs> so I can I how is this still happening? Like that's my that's my disconnect. Uh, like how how is this still happening? How because what this... has interve intervened to change it? Where has there been I mean, a, a strategy to change it? If I'm going to answer with the knowledge that I have, yep. I'm going to say the civil rights movement, right? right. Like, so right. I would assume that yes. this would have changed in the 60s. It, it, so so the, what we have done is actually we've, we've created a, a falsehood. There's, there was really, the civil rights movement was not really what you think it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. So people think the pinnacle achievement of the civil rights movement was the 1964 Civil Rights Act. There have been eight civil rights acts. The first one was in 19, 1866, right after uh, the Civil War. There have been eight civil rights acts. Civil rights acts are meaningless. Why? Because we have a civil rights in the, ingrained in the Constitution as citizens. Civil rights acts are facades. So the second is the Voting Rights Act, 18, 1965. Now, in 1965, the Voting Rights Act all it did was say to white people, you should be adhering to the Constitution, which the 15th, uh, uh, the 15th Amendment to the Constitution already existed. already existed. That gave us voting rights. Right. So we were exercising those back in the 1800s. Why are we still talking about voting rights? Here's what the Civil Rights Movement was about. The Negro American Revolution, as Dr. King wrote in the very first chapter of his book, Why We Can't Wait, it's uh, it, the chapter title is the Negro Revolution by 1963. It is about three things: ending segregation in schools, ending discrimination in housing, ending discrimination in banking, and give and providing access to capital. Those three things we do not talk about to this day, and those three things all have worsened since Dr. King's death. And we do not teach our children the, about the Negro American Revolution because it was. It, it was a nonviolent, direct action protest in a thousand cities that rose up. By 1965, because nothing was happening, it turned violent in Watts. L the LA Watts riots was the first one that turned violent. And in 1967, it spread, the violence spread uh, uh, through 164 cities. 1968, Dr. King is killed, Bobby Kennedy is killed. Riots spread across the nation. Nixon comes, uh, rises to, to uh, rises up in his campaign and says, "We need law and order." He gets elected, and then you have George Wallace, the uh, former governor of Alabama, go to Detroit in 1968, and he stood in the very same venue that Dr. King had stood five years earlier. And Dr. King had said. We are through with segregation. Now, henceforth and forevermore, 25,000 people stood on their feet in that venue. That was two months before he gave his speech on the Washington Mall. And then in, he's, he's dead in 1968. Wallace goes to Cobo Hall in Detroit in the exact same spot where Dr. King stood. And he said, segregation today, tomorrow, and forever. And now you have a white supremacist president who's saying law and order. Let's quell this violence. Let's stop tamp down what, whatever these people are talking about, we don't care. We're just going to, we're going to quell their voices. And so the things that they're talking about, ending segregation in schools and valuing our children are the same as yours, ending, segre ending segregation in housing and providing safety for our communities like you want in yours, and ending discrimination in banking and providing access to capital so we can actually have ownership share of the American dream. Those three things, we're still talking about today. Yeah, well, you know what? I think the problem was that we weren't still talking about them today. <laughs> um, this has been a lot of learning for me. So um, in, in growing up in the way that I've grown up, in the way that I've learned, which is pretty uh, quintessential white American girl in, the, <laughs> in our country, um, I would have been um, very confused that black people don't have equal opportunity in housing. So talk me through, how are these redlining practices still happening? What can, what can we change? What is the action that like I can go on my computer and I'm going to write an email to my, to my leaders? Okay. So uh, 
every city has uh, zoning policies. Every city has a problem with gentrification as the market uh, uh, trends are moving toward uh, taking over these lower income communities and bringing in market rate housing that these people cannot afford. So you have lots of displacement because of market trends. But market trends are not just uh, uh, inevitable. They are managed by policy. And so you have economic development, offices of economic development that put together the strategies and the development plans of how the city is going to operate. So zoning, economic development, and then you have something that is really, most people don't even know exists. And they're called SEDS plans, C-E-D-S, Comprehensive Economic Development Strategies Plans. They are ubiquitous across the United States. Every region has a regional development organization that produces the SEDS plans. And what the SEDS plans do, and they're funded by the federal government, they're funded by state governments, and they're funded by public-private partnership. So everybody has their hands in the SEDS plan. And what they do is they set the conditions, the economic conditions for the next five years in your region. And they cover housing, they cover transportation, they cover investments in growth stage uh, 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 industries. They are looking at how is our community and our region going to be more prosperous over the next five years? And what are the conditions necessary for that to happen? Well, this happens in every region across the nation and not one of those SEDS plans has any type of measurable outcomes for communities of color, not one to this very day. Mm. How do we change that? So what needs to happen? You're doing what needs to happen. You're actually asking the questions. You're curious as to know what's, what's going on, what don't we know that we need to know, and how can we change it? And the answer starts with, we first have to educate the public on things that it did not know, it does not know. We have to know what's happening. You guys mentioned banking. We won't go all the way into banking just because of the time. There has been so much movement online, so much movement. People are excited to um, help. Yes. What, what needs to be real action? Because posting a post is one thing. What is the action that needs to occur? First step action is listening to voices of people that have experiences that are different than us and that can inform and educate us, right? So we have to be super intentional about listening to voices, studying and learning. And there's so much online, Danielle, you know, there's so many people that are sharing um, so a wealth of experience and information. So I think we sit as students underneath people who have information that we don't have. And we posture ourselves with just curiosity and understanding. So I think that's the first place because we can't know what we don't know. And we sort of are in our echo chambers online and we sort of think we ping ideas back and forth and we don't actually have a backdrop of knowledge and understanding. And when we do, I think then, then we're enlightened about where's our insertion point. Oh, now that we're sort of having a fuller picture about what's happening, I see where I can step in. I see who I can connect with. I see who I can write to and reach out to. I see what system I'm involved in that I can actually speak truth into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, the challenge is, and as Emily was saying, we can't know what we don't know. The problem is that if we reach out and we're talking to people who don't look like us, what we're going to learn is their experience. And so the vast majority of black and brown and Asian people, they don't know the history either because they weren't taught. We were all taught under the same uh, school systems and the school systems right now still have a resistance to change. The, the first teachers and the priority mm -hmm. teachers of our children are the parents. That's right, which is a beautiful and enormous responsibility. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was going to ask. What can we do in our homes? We can be intentional about engaging and also including in our conversation information that is always informing and always opening up and we're looking at our home you know we have maps and we are i would say we have a, an incredible multicultural global perspective as a family so that when we're seeing news or when we're reading books boy i am always choosing um literature for our kids that is exposing them to so much and that's just that's what we can do as parents right we can 
check out books in the library that show faces that don't look like our kids' faces. And we can learn about cultures around the world so that our kids can constantly be exposed, right? And then we can have conversations about truth, about what we're seeing on the TV right now and, and what some of that has come from and what's happening in our nation. Now we get to curate and inform, which is just it's beautiful. And we also bring it back to consideration. How do we treat our family? With our consideration. Our human family. And so, and we, we always talk about system. In fact, we even have these role plays that we do with our kids. And we put we make them the school board. That was a fun. That and was we fun. and we give them real issues. We don't we don't just make it up out of whole cloth. We actually use the real issues that school boards are dealing with today. And we ask our children, what would you do? Mm -hmm. And when we see things on the news, when we see the clashes between police and and protesters, and we say to uh, we say to our kids, if you're on this side of the of the uh, of the fence. If you're the protester, what would you do? If you're the police, what would you do? Mm -hmm. If you're a bystander, what would you do? So we give them these uh, these pieces of information that are real. And I think role playing is powerful. They could step into the scene of a protest and they could be observing it as a news person. Like, what are we seeing on scene today? Yes. And why are these protesters here? What are their signs saying? I wonder why they have a sign like that. What would my sign say? And we did ask yeah. our son what his, what would his sign say because we talked to we talked to him about who's in the protest yeah. because you have peaceful protesters mm -hmm. who are anguished who are, who are expressing pain mm -hmm. and you have people who are antagonists and opportunists and you have people who are arsonists they just want to uh, uh, create create damage and we ask our kids if you first of all would you go to this protest and the answer from our boys seven and nine was yes mm -hmm. would you carry a sign. Yes, what would your sign say? And my seven-year-old boy said, my sign would say, George Floyd's life matters. Wow. Wow. Um, I have, I've, I've always thought that my part was to do this within my family, you know, like a, a talk about love, basically, of the human race uh, in my family. But now I feel like that might not be enough. Like, I need to be writing some more emails. I need to be picking some um, organizations to support. Is there, are there any action steps like that that you would suggest? Well, um, <laughs> to tell you the truth, I couldn't find the right organization for me. Mm. And so uh, I pulled together uh, a bunch of folks and we're actually developing that organization right now. Awesome. And it's called the National Institute for Inclusive Competitiveness. Mm. And we pulled together uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, uh, Shell Oil, Aramark, Southern Oregon, I mean Southern Oregon, Southern Regional Education Board, which covers 16 states. We've got the Council on Foundations and a number of different people that are working together, that are in positions of power and influence. We have the Kauffman Foundation, the largest foundation uh, for entrepreneurship uh, involved. And uh, we have uh, uh, folks out of Philadelphia who have already been involved in this, in this battle with me and uh, have proven that we can, we can actually uh, increase the capacity of the most vulnerable population to produce. Mm -hmm. And so it's about prioritizing the most vulnerable population. It's about increasing their capacity. It's about cultivating their talent. And it's about uh, providing them a way sustainably mm -hmm. to own a slice of the American dream. And so that National Institute for Inclusive Competitiveness is launching this week. Oh, wow. How cool. <laughs> Do you have a, is there a website? It's coming this week. So send it over to me whenever that website exists and I will update show notes with it. Um, mm -hmm. I think you. that captures, Danielle, if I could just add is that this is the time and that's what makes me hopeful that this is the time. And there is this sort of growing, incredible motivation from, I mean, the partners that are, that are, that are paying for this, you know, Shell Oil and U.S. Chamber of Commerce, there is this sense that we must 
uh, step into and create more equitable systems. And so they're specifically inserting yes. within education. So they're going to create sure. infrastructure to support educational measures for children. That's one of the NICS agendas. But I think what it captures, and Mike's the strategic advisor for them, is that there is good work happening. And I love that. It's yeah. good work that's actually going to change the lives for most vulnerable Children. That's right. And we're starting with the HBCUs, the historically black colleges and universities. Mm -hmm. They've been underfunded for decades, for generations, and they've done great work. Mm -hmm. And so we're taking something that we know works. We're taking something that we know, the infrastructure that we know has cultivated the most vulnerable populations, the talent in the most vulnerable populations for generations. Mm -hmm. And we are providing them the capacity to do more. The fact is, that there's so much energy right now because you know we're becoming more and more of a multicultural society, and ultimately we cannot continue to um, we cannot continue to have the kind of wealth and sustain the kind of uh, economic competitiveness or global competitiveness that we have as today a as a nation with so much of our population producing so little. Right. And so we have to increase their capacity, and that's what this whole focus is about. I do end these podcasts by asking, what is your number one tip to happiness? And I want to ask you guys as well. Number one tip for happiness in the good, the bad, and the in-between. Oh, I love that. The number one tip to happiness is identifying the gift and the blessing of today and then stepping into it, offering love and receiving love in today. I love that. Mike, you're up. I think it's uh, it's valuing the people around you. Mm. I value my wife. I value my children. I value my friends. Mm. Uh, I, I value the people around me. And so it, it makes me feel good to know that there's so many great people That's around right. me. And I want to make sure that I give that value back. Mm. Mm. I love that. Thank you guys both so much for coming on the podcast today. Oh, I really nice. appreciate it. Thank you incredible couple, right? I hope you really enjoyed this conversation. I hope you've learned something new and meaningful that you can bring into your own lives and help make change across our country. And with that, I want to thank you for being here on Happiness and Progress.